Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome to the end of the year recap. How are you feeling about it, man? Oh, I'm feeling really good about it. We had such a good year, Brian. It was a lot of fun. We had to go through and make some tough decisions recently to figure out what episodes we're going to feature in this recap episode. And all of these interviews were engaging in their own way, but we managed to pick out how many? 12, 11? Yeah, we picked out a dozen. Right on. Yeah. So we're going to talk about all of these interviews in order, and they are not necessarily greatest hits, but they're just episodes that resonated with either you or me or both for a variety of reasons. And let's jump right in. Okay. The first interview we're going to talk about is actually the first interview of 2021. And that is the interview with Naomi Grossman from American Horror Story. That scene where I'm saying goodbye to Jessica Lange, I was really saying goodbye to Jessica Lange. I knew there in that moment that this was it. I probably wasn't going to work with her again. I was saying goodbye to this home I made in New Orleans. I was saying goodbye to all my new friends, you know, the freaks, Kathy Bates, Zara Paul, I mean, the whole gang. I was saying goodbye to Pepper. I mean, let's face it, I'd really come to love this person and this job. It really was a true goodbye. Naomi was probably the most animated and energetic guest that I had interviewed up to that point. Mm Mm-hmm basically a firecracker of a guest and it was so fun. And I remember looking at her on the Zoom screen and she could hardly contain her energy and her excitement and her laughter. Mm -hmm. What's most surprising about Naomi is the contrast between how she presents and looks in real life and how she looks on American Horror Story. She plays a couple of different characters on that show, but the one she's most famous for is, of course, Pepper. Right. And if you have not seen that show, just Google Pepper American Horror Story and you'll see what I mean. She's a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. She looks nothing like the character that she plays. And that's just one small piece of what makes her so fascinating. She's a great actress. And I was honored to have her as my first guest in 2021. Yeah, I agree. I've become such a big fan of Naomi's, Uh, not just because of her role as Pepper on American Horror Story. Um, I actually follow her on Instagram and she's always posting funny shit on there. Um, you know, she is. Oh, she's great on social media. Absolutely. Uh, she's definitely not someone who's shy about, you know, putting it all out there and just being herself. So, you know, I'm really glad that we got to sit down with her on the podcast. It really turned out to be a great episode. It's a great way to kick off the year. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. The next interview we're featuring is our chat with Justin Connor, who is not just a former guest. He is a friend. Right on. And he wasn't a friend before we chatted, but during that interview and in conversations and and emails back and forth afterwards, we developed a bond and I can't explain it. There's just certain guests that really resonate with me and, and there's a connection there that goes beyond the podcast. And that happened with Justin. I think what I'm really drawn to and what I'm starting to gain more clarity on for myself in terms of just promoting this film, as well as moving on to the next project thereafter is really trusting that uniqueness, that it's more important to really define and own your own style, theories, impetus, and what creates it than trying to conform to something else. It's funny how it took me such a long time to make this huge project to now come to this base of like, it's okay to live a terribly unique life on my own terms and own that. Even if not many people love it or millions do, it's irrelevant. I think just owning what it is you want to do, even if it's totally abstract to everyone else. And I, and I champion every musician, artist, poet, filmmaker that does that. For folks who don't know who Justin Connor is or didn't listen to the episode, check out his movie on Amazon Prime called The Golden Age, and you will see just how talented he is. He wrote that movie. He directed it. He starred in it. He wrote the soundtrack for it. All of the songs in the soundtrack are his original tunes. And what I gathered from the interview 
is that he is kind of a Zen master. He has a really unique perspective on the world that is founded, I think, in Buddhism or some type of spiritual practice that makes him seem wise beyond his years. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed connecting with him on that level. And since that time, we've talked on the phone, we've emailed back and forth, we've shared advice with each other and have made connections for each other in the entertainment industry. And I am just honored to not only have him on the show and feature him as one of the top interviews of 2021, but to call him my friend. Nice. Yeah. I mean, Justin Connor blew me away in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, he's an immensely talented musician and songwriter. And then to be that songwriter, but also be the director and creator of this film, The Golden Age, where he stays in character as this other persona, this Maya O'Malley, and writes and produces all of the songs in the movie as he's making the film and portraying this artist. It was just like this deep dive into the mind of Justin Connor. And I'm just really glad that we were able to get that interview. He's a cool guy. And he also has a book coming out that is a follow up to the Golden Age movie. That's right. I'm hoping that in 2022, we'll be able to get our hands on that book and maybe talk to him for a follow up interview. That would be great. Keith Thomas is up next. And Keith is a screenwriter and director. He directed a movie called The Vigil. And it's a terrifying minimalist horror movie that he put together for an amazingly low budget for how much suspense is packed into this little film. And Keith got so much recognition and accolades for his work on The Vigil that he got the attention of Stephen King and will soon be remaking Firestarter. And for folks who are maybe a little younger and don't know what Firestarter is, it's a very popular horror movie from the 1980s starring Drew Barrymore when she was a little kid. And to be picked by Stephen King to direct that remake is quite an honor. If you make something that is true to your vision, that isn't you just mimicking things you've seen, your favorite films or scenes that you're stitching together as a fan of other work, but it's something that you have to make, something that you are driven to make, that it's possessed you and you have to create this thing. Look, your first script you have all the time in the world. Nobody's waiting for you to deliver your first script. Rewrite it. Get it perfect before you show it to anybody. The same goes for making your first short. You have all the time in the world to get it ready. Don't bother shopping things around or sending things until it's ready. And then just go there and make it. Actions speak louder than words in this industry more than any. The thing I really liked about Keith was that he was able to give practical advice for folks that want to break into the industry, that want to write screenplays or direct films. And even though it was a short interview, there was so much wisdom packed into that chat that's why I featured it in our top interviews of 2021. Well, yeah, I mean, Keith Thomas is a pretty amazing guy. He's got a very impressive background. I mean, he's received a master's degree in religious education from the uh, Hebrew Union College in New York. And, uh, you know, he's just on this upward trajectory right now in the film industry. And I think actually 2022 is the year that he's uh, slated to finally get this rendition of Stephen King's Firestarter done and out. So I'm looking forward to that. And maybe once that comes out, we can get back in touch with Keith and have a chat about that experience. I love it. I love follow-up interviews with former guests. Absolutely. You know, Jason, a lot of our guests tend to be from the music industry or the film industry. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make sure that we featured a guest outside of that industry. Okay. Her name is Nikki Pilkington. You remember Nikki? I do. She's a Welsh neon artist. So I worked in this gallery, in an art gallery. It's actually the oldest art gallery in Wales. It's beautiful. And it sort of runs a lot with volunteers. And a lot of them are elderly, retired Welsh people. And I was chatting to these women and they'd keep saying these old proverbs and things. And I'd be like, hang on, I've grown up in Wales. How have I never heard that? So I started making a note of all these things. And some of them make no sense, but they were just so, so interesting. And I just felt like it was so sad that these old phrases were just vanishing. So I started writing them down and then started putting them in my work. The juxtaposition of my quite modern, edgy-ish kind of neon drawings mixed with these old Welsh phrases was just something that hadn't been done before. And luckily it was sort of accepted. I thought, oh God, that these elderly Welsh people are going to think, what has she done to the Welsh language? But it was really lovely. I had my first exhibition at that gallery and it sold out and it was just like mind-blowing to me. 
Nikki was so cool to talk to. And I really make an effort because I lean so heavily into film and music. I make an effort to reach out to artists outside of those industries. And Nikki was someone that I've been following on social media for a while because her Instagram following is huge for good reason. She has this amazing consistency in the look of her Instagram posts. And she has, I think, 80 some thousand followers. And this is a person from Wales, Mm -hmm. very small country in the United Kingdom that speaks Welsh and she incorporates the Welsh language into her work, as you just heard in the quote from her interview. But she has managed to take that work and sort of mainstream it in a way where she is living all over the world. I mean, she's moving to Paris and London and New York and Los Angeles. And right. the way that I found her, if I remember correctly, was Max Flower. And Max ran into her in Santa Monica or Venice Beach and told me to check out her Instagram and, and make a connection with her. So that's how I met Nikki. And she stands out as someone who has a lot of wisdom, not just about art and creativity, but about the importance of mental health and having a healthy approach to social media. And that's what we talked a lot about during her interview. Yeah. Yeah. She's such a talented artist. I I really love her work. And I remember you guys talking on Zoom and she was in England at the time, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she had just moved to London and and there was a big shutdown there. I think she was stuck in her apartment there and the the Wi-Fi connection went down and she had to switch to her hotspot. But thank goodness the hotspot worked uh, well enough so that we could have a decent conversation. Yeah, I remember she talked about the ups and downs of social media and her anxiety and was pretty open about those discussions. So it was really, it was a lovely chat and I'm glad that she was able to share her life with us in that way. The next guest we want to feature, Jason, is probably not a surprise to you at all, because this guest I had a very special connection to through my dad. Mm -hmm. Her name is Sue Ennis. She had been writing a song about her mom, and so she sent me those lyrics, and I was able to tinker and put a little screw in here and put a syllable there, and it just fit really nicely with my melody Mm -hmm. and added to it uh, quite a bit, too. So it was a true collaboration on the lyrics, and we both were of one, I was going to say mind, but really one heart, wanting to conjure up a scenario where we could meet our moms again. And I don't mean in any kind of weird woo-woo way, but rather that impulse that sometimes we have when our moms are gone, when you're in a hard place or a lonely place or whatever it may be. And you think, if I could just call my mom right now, those Ah. of us who were lucky enough to have Right. The four relationships, you know. So in any case, that was something that uh, we both had experienced that if only I could just talk to her. And it was so cool to have Nance sing it. I was so thrilled that the song turned into something that she fully embraced and sang with so much sincerity. What I loved about Sue Ennis was not only the fact that she had written behind the scenes a lot of, or co-written, I should say, Mm -hmm. a lot of heart songs. And I have this connection to heart through my dad, which you know about. But Sue really opened up a portal for me into the songwriting process. And in fact, I got out my guitar during the interview impromptu and decided to play a song that I had not finished, that I started writing in high school, had not finished yet. And she actually coached me through the process of finishing that song. And Sue, for folks who don't know Sue Ennis, have not heard that interview. She is a songwriter from Seattle. She's a professor of songwriting. She has workshops and classes and does private lessons via Zoom and in person. And she is immensely talented and is behind a lot of amazing heart songs and even sang on and and actually co-wrote songs with Nancy Wilson on her first solo album, which was released this year. Mm Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that episode with Sue. She she had a lot to say about her times with Anne and Nancy Wilson apart, and I know that she has written over 80 songs with them alone. So uh, she is definitely someone who knows her stuff when it comes to songwriting. And I know she even teaches classes up at Shoreline College on songwriting. So pretty amazing. I mean, she helped write every single song on Dog and Butterfly. I mean, come on. Dude. That's a testament. Dude, one of my favorite heart albums ever. Yeah. Yeah. And she's got writing credits on every song. So pretty amazing. Do you remember after that interview when I called you and you asked me how it went? Yes. Yes. You were, you were over the moon, man. I was. I was so excited about how it went. And the reason for that is that 
there's just certain guests that bring out the best in me and not to pat myself on the back too much about, you know, my, my own work, but I just felt like she facilitated a conversation that turned into something really special. Mm -hmm. And I plan on going back and listening to that interview again, probably in January, because I have it on my bucket list to write more songs in 2022. She's going to be instrumental to that process. I know when I listened to the interview, it inspired me to start writing again too. So hats off to Sue Ennis for that. Jason, another guest that probably doesn't come as a surprise at all to be on this list is Moby. The only criteria I apply to music is how does it make me feel when it's coming out of two speakers? And I, to that end, I'll put anything into the actual compositional process without you know, without any sort of formality or adherence to genre. Um, and the end result is people have been confused by my approach to music, but all I care about is that magical moment that hopefully I've achieved a few times when a piece of music, whether I've made it or someone else has made it, when a piece of music is playing and it's transcendent. Jason, what I felt was transcendent about Moby was how he was able to talk to a complete stranger, me, and share very intimate, vulnerable things about himself. Now, granted, he shared some of these things in biographies that he's written and in songs and other interviews, mm -hmm. but this is a guy who has been through hell and back, through addiction and through a lot of success and a lot of failures, a lot of ups and downs in his career. And I think he's really found his stride in the last couple of years in terms of songwriting and more importantly, collaboration. And this guy collaborates with amazing artists all over the world right? and puts out work that I have so much respect for. And I have a new respect for Moby. I've always respected his work. But after this interview and doing the research for the interview, listening to all of his albums and his most recent album reprise, I just feel like Moby is one of the most important figures in music today. Oh, absolutely. I was super excited when you got that interview with Moby. Uh, he's someone who's been in my musical consciousness since probably the mid to late 90s. And if you're into electronic music at all, there's no way that you can deny the influence that Moby has had on that genre. And he continues to reinvent himself musically, which a lot of artists don't do. And you're not going to be invited into David Bowie's inner circle to tour with him, <laughs> to play with him, unless you are a fucking badass. Right. And that's what happened with Moby. Yep. He was brought into David Bowie's inner circle, and uh, not many people can say that. It's pretty amazing. No. So it was, it was a real honor to be able to chat with him, and I, I was on the edge of my seat a couple of times during the interview because my Wi-Fi connection was awful during that interview. <laughs> and you know I had been complaining about it for weeks. And sure enough, it failed several times. And he was so gracious and he stayed on the line and we didn't lose any of the audio and it worked out fine. Yeah, he was very patient. I appreciated that. Next up is our first in-person interview of 2021, Mark Pickerel. You may remember I traveled up to Ellensburg to Mark's antique shop to interview him in his office there. And the, oh, yeah. the audio challenges were obvious when you listened that we were both in squeaky chairs and you could hear traffic driving by in the background. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, I love that face-to-face -face interview experience. And it was, uh, it was refreshing to actually sit down face-to-face -face with Mark and have him be my first face-to-face -face interview of the year. Mark was humble. Uh, he is wise. And he had a lot to offer in terms of the creative process and how he writes songs and how he made connections in the industry. Here's Mark talking about his first introduction to Brandy Carlisle. The first opportunity I had with her was playing on her um, Sony debut. And that was just an opportunity that I think I was only given like a day's notice, maybe two days notice to come to Seattle. It was around 2005. Anyway, I had no prior knowledge of her, hadn't heard any of her music before. And she just taught me the songs on the spot, just sang, like, came and sat down with, a, with an acoustic guitar right next to the drums. You know, I thought maybe I'd hear a demo or something, mm -hmm. but it was just her and her guitar. And man, I knew immediately yeah. that I was dealing with a talent of a different caliber. Very special. Yeah. And to have Brandy Carlisle look you in the eye, and that's the funny thing about when she teaches you a song, 
she sings it to you, <laughs> not just in the same room with you, <laughs> but she she looks into your eyes for the entire duration of the song. And um, mesmerizing. It it was mesmerizing. Yeah. I mean, I got chills as I was listening to her, and she's still that's still the, the way she teaches people songs. Well, you know, that name, Mark Pickerel, automatically takes me back to the late 80s, early 90s with the Screaming Trees, which was a pretty popular grunge band from Ellensburg, Washington, and he played drums for them. Yeah. If you're from Eastern Washington, Central Washington, anywhere in Washington, and you grew up in the 80s and 90s, uh, Screaming Trees were integral to your musical formation. Oh, yeah. And of course, Ellensburg, Washington is about 30 miles north of us here. Right. So it was really close and accessible. But uh, what's really cool about Mark is how he has become his own artist and has created this vibe, almost like this rockabilly type vibe. And so it's just, it's really cool. I feel like he embodies music history and just history in general, because I know he's also an antique collector and runs an antique shop in Ellensburg, which is where you interviewed him. Yeah. That was so fun. I'm just surrounded by costumes and cowboy boots and leather jackets and vintage denim. Right. And it really is his vibe. You talk about this rockabilly sound that he has. Mm -hmm. And he was featured recently in a magazine article out of, um, it's a magazine out of London. He posted this on Facebook just a little while back. Wow. Where he was described as someone whose music should be featured in a Quentin Tarantino movie. And I thought that <laughs> was a very astute observation. Mm, definitely. I want to thank my friend and fellow attorney, Brendan Monahan for making that introduction to Mark. I met him over lunch before the interview at a bar in Yakima. And that's when <laughs> Brendan brought up the possibility of an interview and broached that subject. And that's how the interview got set up. Nice. Jason, I would be remiss. We would both be remiss if we did not talk about the one, the only, the legendary, the singular, Tommy Chong. This was our very first rehearsal, and by the way, the only rehearsal <laughs> that we ever did uh, was uh, a, a record that went viral immediately, even before we had finished the album. We did a bit called Dave's Not Here. Okay, I remember that. And that, that went, we recorded it one night. Uh, that night, Lou sent it out to the radio stations, and that morning, the next morning, we were famous. Jason, I did not know what to expect when I logged into Zoom to talk to Tommy. Mm -hmm. But I, I can tell you that I had no idea that I would be talking to Tommy from his bedroom while he's sitting on his bed <laughs> and holding his phone up to his face <laughs> right. as his wife is walking in and out of the room with laundry. And uh, basically, they're just living their lives. Yeah. And I was thinking, because Tommy Chong, I mean, come on, one of the, the biggest yeah. comedians of the 80s and 90s and even 2000s on that 70s show, mm -hmm. I was thinking, okay, we've got to keep this thing tight. He's going to be busy. He's got lots of things to do. I couldn't get this guy off the call. I mean, he wanted to keep <laughs> talking forever. <laughs> and I wasn't trying to get off the Zoom call because I was bored or whatever. I was just trying to be respectful of his time and also trying to keep the interview to a reasonable length. Right. But he, he just enjoys talking about his career and he has all kinds of thoughts and opinions about politics. I had to shave down his interview quite a bit, actually, because mm -hmm. it, it really went in places that I think are appropriate for you know YouTube if you want to see the longer version. Uh, we had to cut out a couple of stories that he told because they were just a little too salty for um, for the <laughs> podcast. But yeah, he's a great guy and what a legend. Oh, truly. Uh, I was going to say we probably should cue the lowrider music before that started, but <laughs> what can you say about Tommy Chong that hasn't been mentioned before? I mean, he's just a legend in comedy and embraces his stoner persona, you know, the right. the character man that he plays in the Cheech Chong movies and the records. Just this heavy stoner guy that gets into all of these shenanigans with his partner Cheech. Right. And, uh, you know, also, I, I love his character, Leo, on that 70s show where he's basically just plays himself. <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like he can pull off the certain character just by acting naturally. Right. But in real life, he's also this super intelligent businessman, you know? Oh, yeah. And totally social media savvy, too. Way more savvy than I am. <laughs> Me too. This guy posts TikToks and he's on there with his wife. 
all the time. I mean, he's got a brand going with the marijuana yep. um, paraphernalia. And gosh, this guy has a lot going on. And he's like, what, 85? Is that how old he is? Or 80? Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. What an amazing stamina and endurance that he has in entertainment. I know that if we were to go back in time, say 30 years, 40 years, and tell Tommy Chong that he was going to have his own brand of weed and his own <laughs> brand of paraphernalia, he would have went, no way, man. As he's serving a, a federal prison sentence for <laughs> selling uh, bongs in the wrong state. Exactly. You say, you know what? Don't worry. Down the road, this is all going to be legal. <laughs> <laughs> I love Tommy Chong. Next up, Jason, is Al D. This movie is a knucklehead movie. Old, old fashioned, old school, rock and roll, knucklehead story. Very insane, insanity, but with a heart, heartfelt. No superficial stuff, no hypocrisy stuff. It's, yeah. it's a pure heart. Oh. Also, this, this movie, there's so much emotion in this movie. It's not just about two, two men uh, being, being stupid. Also, so much broken heart, so much sadness. But eventually, this movie is about brotherhood. You know, it's about brother pick each other up. Brother, be there for you. It's a brother's movie. As you can tell, Jason, and as the audience can tell, he is from China. Mm -hmm. So English is not his first language. But if you listen to that clip and really listen closely, you can hear that this guy can communicate in ways that are transcendent above actual language. I mean, this guy has so much passion and emotion in what he's trying to impart. And honestly, when he was saying those words, this is a knucklehead movie, but you know, there's heart and it's about brotherhood. Mm -hmm. It brought me to tears. Right. I think if you go back and look at the YouTube version of this interview, you'll probably be able to see some tears will end up in my eyes. And that's what's so magical about Al D. And I think that's what makes him such a great movie producer. Of course, we're talking about one of the co-stars of a movie called Some of Our Stallions, which mm -hmm. was um, written and directed by Carson Mell, who we also interviewed on the podcast. That's right. And Olivia Taylor Dudley was also a star of that movie. Mm -hmm. And a great film if you want to go check it out. But Al D, the reason I featured him in this recap is that there's just something really special about him in terms of his charisma. Right. And I think I've talked to you about charisma before. There's just a magic that certain people have to mm -hmm. bring you into their world. And that's what Al D did on this Zoom screen. And ever since that interview, we have connected on social media and we've made plans to get together the next time he goes to Seattle or maybe Los Angeles and I'll fly down there and hang out with him because um, he's a musician, I'm a musician, you're a musician, and I know you connect with him as well at, on that level. Mm -hmm. But I love Aldi. Oh, he's a character, man. You know, I follow him on Instagram, and he's always posting something hilarious on there. <laughs> I know we're we're always sending each other his posts because they're fucking hilarious. Oh my god, I can't stop laughing every time. And I just I just know that we're going to hear from this guy in the future. Uh, you know, he has so much to offer, not just in the diversity of himself or the characters he portrays, but also his comedic approach to what he does. And he's just so sincere. He just has this ability to be serious, but also can make it funny in a natural way. That's what I love about Al. Yeah, I hear you. You know, Jason, we also have to talk about Jeff Fielder. So I would put myself in these situations to make myself sort of getting more and more used to being in an uncomfortable situation, both physically sort of in, a, you know, physical groups and then artistically, like taking a lot of like chances and putting myself in situations that were like, I don't know if I can pull this off. And then just seeing how it went. And sometimes I pulled it off and sometimes it didn't, but it was always learning something, mm -hmm. you know. And so when it came time to jump in to some of these higher end gigs, I felt like I had sort of prepared myself for that just mentally, which is good. And then also just kind of knowing your role, not overplaying, not being a hot shot, but also when it's time to do something, lay it down right, you know, mm -hmm. and then back it up, you know, and just kind of knowing where to, you know, you got to know when to hold them, right? Know when to fold them. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell from that interview that I, I really got a kick out of Jeff Fielder. That is funny. Jeff, Jeff is one of those guys, Jason, that. I, I didn't have a connection with him after the interview. Mm. You know, he, he didn't promote the episode afterwards. He's, he's busy. I get that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's got so much going on. He's collaborating with so many amazing artists and he has his own music that he's writing. He's collaborating with his wife, Tekla Waterfield. 
Mm -hmm. So I don't begrudge him for not maintaining those communications with me after the interview like Justin and Al did. But I still love this guy. I, I love his work. I love how humble he is, the humility, even though he's collaborating with folks like Duff McKagan, Mark Lanigan, Amy Ray, and uh, he's just a legendary sideman and also a frontman. He's a songwriter. He really minimizes and is, I think, is overly modest about his abilities as a songwriter and a performer as the lead singer. Mm -hmm. But that just makes him all the more appealing to me. And plus, he's a Seattle guy, mm -hmm. and he grew up in Seattle with all of these bands and around all of these bands that you and I admire so much. So it's that connection that made me want to feature Jeff in this recap. Yeah. And again, another great connection to the Northwest music community. Just like Mark Pickerel. Yeah. Yeah. And another link to the Screaming Trees because he's got this uh, friendship going with Mark Lanigan. So, right, right. And just a super talented guy, great guitar player. I bought his album, The Last Disguise, a while back mm -hmm. and really thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, he just kind of has this bluesy, swampy kind of vibe going on. Love his guitar tone. I know that he's an amp junkie, so he really knows how to dial in the perfect tone. Yeah. You can especially appreciate that because you're just such a an audiophile when it comes to tone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I also like the fact that he's not a huge show off. He just embraces the music and just naturally delivers the goods. Yep. He lays it down and backs it up. <laughs> knows when to hold them. And when to fold them. Right on. <laughs> I love that reference. You know, another guest that I really enjoyed getting to know was Owner Tukel. Oh, man, what a character. Owner, man, there's so much I can say about Owner. But let me just say this. The first 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of the interview, which you cut out, rightfully so, <laughs> uh, but is still there on YouTube, is him interviewing me. That's right. So this is... This is a guy, he's a screenwriter, he's a director, he's a producer. Owner Tukel is so naturally curious about everyone around him. And I think that's what makes him an awesome storyteller. I think you're right. The beautiful thing about making a movie every year or two is that it's always a new experience. I, I kind of compare it to like having a startup company and, and getting investors and creating a startup. It's fun. You, sometimes a startup is successful. Most of the time it's not. Um, for at least for me, but every year we get to try it again. And so what makes making movies fun and interesting and curious is the chance to go in new territories. Right. And uh, so that is the, the goal and the hope is to use whatever grief I experienced or whatever memories I have of my mother or whatever else is the next phase, a post-COVID phase, or maybe a phase where it's about music or, or just playing music or making an album or or writing a novel i want to keep making movies but at the same time there are different chapters and it's like okay maybe it's time to focus on something else for a while you know owner to is so talented as a musician as a writer he wrote a children's book that was basically a retelling of the movie the original movie halloween by john carpenter <laughs> uh, he has all of these movies out and, and some of them are really crazy and bizarre. For example, That Cold Dead Look in Your Eyes is a movie that came out after our interview. We were there to talk about scenes from an empty church. Right. And you, you could not get more different from the movie Scenes from an Empty Church than That Cold Dead Look in Your Eyes, which is a homoerotic mystery. I, I don't even know how to describe this movie, but it was fantastic. It was delicious. It was... <laughs> So many things that I can't even articulate because I don't know film that well, but he graciously sent me a streamer for it. And one of the things that he said when he emailed me with the, the link to watch this movie, that cold dead look in your eyes, is uh, he said, some people hate it. <laughs> Tell me what you think. And I think he fucking loves it. I think he loves that he gets a reaction, right? you know, and that's the true, that's the true artist coming out in him, which is that he wants his art to evoke emotion. And even if the emotion is disgust or anger or laughter or sadness, he wants it to have an impact on his audience. Right. And Owner Tekel, he is a lovely, lovely human being. And we've had some exchanges by email since the interview where um, he's introducing me to basically the world of film investing and producing which I've been thinking about getting into for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. 
And he's also trying to facilitate an interview with one of his friends who's a film director. And I'm not going to say the name because I don't want to jinx it, but he's working on that for me. Right. And what a kind man. I mean, this is a guy that has so much on his plate, so much going on, and yet takes the time to help me, someone he didn't know before we chatted on the Zoom screen. I tell you, for folks who have not listened to that interview yet, go check it out. It's a little longer than most. What is it, like an hour and 45 minutes or so? Yeah. Maybe an hour and a half. Yeah. And uh, there's some funny, funny stories that he tells. And I waited until the very end to ask him about getting kicked off of a podcast recently. That's right. And he actually got kicked off twice. And he told that story. (laughs) And he was so gracious to tell that story and so humble and uh, didn't try to spin it in any way that made other people look bad. Right. But I think it's a testament to owner's character and his maturity and um, just, you know, he's a great guy. And that was uh, Doug Benson's podcast, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. (laughs) You know, uh, owner is one of those filmmakers who's just not afraid to push the boundaries and take risks. That's what I like about him. And I think we talked about how we drew parallels between owner to Kel and Quentin Tarantino. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Very similar personalities and attitude about making films too. Yeah. Very prolific. Just keeps on cranking out the movies. Mm-hmm. and um, is singular and unique. I mean, an Owner to Kel movie is a movie that you can guarantee you have never seen before. You've never seen a movie that even comes close to what he's trying to accomplish with that film. Yeah, yep. So for folks who go back and listen to that interview, it will be obvious why he is included in the 2021 recap. Last but not least, Jason, is Justine Bateman. To me, there is still a very specific barrier to entry that will never change. And that is being good. Hmm. Is what you're doing good? For anybody who's not in the business, but is thinking about getting into business, I just ask them, why? Right. It's fucking hard. The work is hard. To write something that's really good and then to get it funded and then to make it work when you're shooting it, which can be two different things. And then to make it work in the edit and then to hit a particular zeitgeist, however small, in society, at that moment, it gets released. <laughs> like, and all the components that are, you know, getting the right people together to do it. And there's so many ways it can go sideways. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself why you're doing this. If your answer is, I can't not do it. I tried not to do it. I can't not do it. I have to do it. You're going to be fine. Jason, she is no bullshit. Mm-mm. Just listen to that quote. There is 0% bullshit in that quote. Absolutely. And that was the way the entire interview went with Justine. If I remember correctly, when I called you after the interview, I had a similar reaction that I did after the interview with Sue Ennis, which was, this was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited about how it played out. Yeah, you did. I remember you calling me. Yeah, absolutely. You really pulled in some great guests this year, Brian, I got to tell you. And Justine Bateman is, is absolutely one of those. You know, when I think of Justine Bateman, um, I think of, you know, my early teens uh, watching Family Ties and she played Mallory on on Family Ties. Right. But, you know, she's gone on to do so much more than that show. She's been on a ton of well-known shows. She was, um, you know, my wife was uh, re-watching Desperate Housewives and she was on a couple of episodes of that uh, several years back. And now she's this writer, producer and director. She wrote and directed uh, that movie, Violet, which you guys talked about. Yeah, with Olivia Munn. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you guys talked about that. And along with her books, she's just super talented and very down to earth, which made the interview very deep, but at the same time, a lot of fun. Yeah, I learned a lot from Justine in that interview. And before the interview and going into the interview, I was worried about the fact that I had associated her with family ties for so long. Mm that I would involuntarily bring that up. But I consciously decided, you know what? She's probably talked about family ties for decades and she's moved past it. So Mm -hmm. let's just not even bother with that subject. And we didn't. And I'm glad I didn't talk about it because there was so much to chat about. It went uh, longer than most interviews, which most of the good ones do. We did dive into some pretty deep subjects like fame Mm -hmm. and notoriety and ego. And what it means to be good, as that quote indicates, the barrier to entry that she talks about. Right. She is so wise. And and, that, and that's what I love about talking to these guests is that what we're doing, Jason, is we are compiling the greatest hits 
of the nuggets of wisdom, and we're putting them in the recap, and we're also in the show notes summarizing that wisdom for listeners who want to go back. We also have transcripts that we're working on getting posted on the website so folks can actually read transcripts. The hearing impaired can get value out of these episodes that way as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I tell you, out of all of the episodes that have launched this year where folks have given me feedback, unsolicited, just out of the blue, people texting me, calling me, emailing me, Justine Bateman was the interview that resonated most with my listeners and uh, for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, like I said, you pulled out some great ones this year. This last couple of years have been really great, really great learning experience. And so on to 2022. Speaking of 2022, Mm -hmm. I got a message from a publicist today from uh, someone who represents a film director who has a film at Sundance, and I'm not going to name names at this point because I don't like to jinx anything. But what I wanted to say, Jason, is the action has already started. (laughs) We are uh, starting to see some movement from the Sundance press situation, and uh, I'm really excited about the film lineup this year. I'm excited about the opportunities to talk to filmmakers about their experience getting their film made and uh, entered into Sundance, one of the most prestigious film festivals in the entire world. And what an honor it's going to be to participate as a member of the press. I'm looking forward to it, Brian. Really excited. And Jason, I also wanted to say that I love you, man. (laughs) I do. I love you too. I can't thank you enough for all that you've done to support me this year. And uh, it's been a tough year. I mean, we've lost friends. Your mom's had some health issues. Mm -hmm. And it's been tough to get through for everybody. But I think this podcast has been a source of solace for you and I to where you know, we can connect. We know. We know we're going to connect, you and I, yep. about things that we really care about, about film, about music, about television, about art, about creativity. And you are an integral part of that process, Jason. Your work to make these episodes sound fantastic is much appreciated. Your insight into the types of guests we should be booking, all of the advice that you give me as a producer, thank you. I appreciate that, Brian. And uh, I'm looking forward to you know, be in there for you. As long as we need to do this, Brian, it really helps me with my sanity as well. Right on, brother. Happy New Year. Right on, man. Happy New Year to you. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.